there's a, almost a bit of a role reversal that that is uh, in the offing, I think, where she is, you know, going to be starting to become the caretaker and uh, and, and the grown up, I guess you could say. Yeah. Tony, uh, I want to start with you. Uh, it's really fascinating in the show in uh, for season four. Abe is now a theater critic, which is really cool. <laughs> uh, do you think this is one way that uh, Midge and Abe could sort of come together again to be closer now that they're both in a creative atmosphere? I, I definitely think they are. Their lives are are. Uh starting to converge slowly certainly we're gonna we're gonna begin to see that in season four where you know they're they're, they're both especially after the crash and burn uh moment of of uh, midge's career at the end of season three right where she's bounced off of the tour shy baldwin's tour so now both abe and midge are kind of having to regroup and start over and i think for abe it's like a He's discovering this, it's a humbling moment for him. And, uh, you know, where he's, sure, he's happy to be working at this job, but he's taken a massive cut in pay. And, uh, you know, no longer, now he's, he's not living in his own home anymore, of course. And so, so they're, they're, they're beginning to, to uh, there's a, almost a bit of a role reversal that, that is uh, in the offing, I think, where, she is, she is, you know, going to be starting to become the caretaker and, uh, and, and the grown up, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. It, it must be really hard for Abe to kind of sort of come to grips with that idea that like now, yeah. now he has to rely on his daughter who's in a job that he initially yeah. didn't even approve of. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. It's humbling. And, you know, there's going to be probably alcohol involved <laughs> in his future. <laughs> Uh, so, Kevin, while Abe is getting a greater appreciation of what Midge does, Moisha is now struggling to connect with Joel because he's got his new job as nightclub owner. Uh, but the two actually do have something in common because they're both entrepreneurs. Are the, are the father and son going to figure that out and maybe uh, fix their relationship? Well, listen, uh, Moisha's decision to tell his son to get out of the garment district hand him a what what at the time was large check <laughs> of money to start his new life um i think the nightclub represents him pursuing his own ambition and, and dream which uh is ultimately all moish wanted um the idea of being involved with show folk as you see moish's reaction to Midge all along, every time she mentions she's a comedian, and he says, but you're not funny. Um, you know, the, the idea that Joel would go to the nightclub business, and in Moish's mind, what does he know from that? Uh, there's going to be some conflict. Um, but I, I just love how both families find out about, about Midge being, being not on the road while at Coney Island on this wonder wheel. Uh, that that was pretty stupefying and wonderful. How crazy was it to film that? Because you're having like a whole conversation on a Ferris wheel and you're yelling back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> How did I can, that work out? I can promise you it was much more bizarre than you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're, uh, we're not really sure how we did it, frankly. <laughs> it was kind of one of those miraculous things uh, that that uh, our our genius uh, creators and cinematographers crew uh, helped to make happen. Was it, was it really impressive to see how they could not only just, I mean, it must always be a challenge to recreate that atmosphere, but to do it under the circumstances of today where you, you're trying to stay safe during the pandemic, how it must have been kind of just crazy to watch them work. Yeah, that scene uh, at Coney Island leading up to the Wonder Wheel where we're walking through and it's shot on, as a wonder and all one take and there are hundreds of extras around us. Uh, a year ago, January of 2021 was a pretty scary time, um, germ-wise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And so we went, yeah, from isolation to, to that. Uh, but being in the outdoors, certainly. But, but we also had a very strict COVID, uh, COVID yeah. protocol the whole time. Much, you know, daily testing. Um, and, uh, and if there were, and we all, um, at one point we were uh, very on, we started uh, carrying little, little tracers in our, in our clothes, in our wardrobe. Uh, where, so they could tell that if anyone ever did test positive, then they would know who intersected with that person at any given moment. It was uh, it was super high tech. Wait a and, second. Are we not supposed <laughs> to still be carrying those? <laughs> did you take yours home with you? <laughs> Are they still tracking you? Honey, throw out the tracer. Well, maybe they'll work in the Cold War spy tactics, and you'll yeah. Give yeah. You know, he, Tony's not wrong or exaggerating. We we were <laughs> tested within an inch of our lives on a on a daily yeah. basis, as was the crew and everyone, and um, yeah, it was yeah. Se severe protocols. Uh, well, Kevin, since you've come from a, this world of comedy yourself, has it ever been frustrating that you don't get to do stand up comic and? Comedy in the show. <laughs> well, it's been one of the bizarre twists of my uh, so-called <laughs> career. I made a left-hand turn somewhere in the late '80s, early '90s into dramatic acting, which was not the plan or what I had trained for. So this whole thing has been a surprise and a, a bizarro world uh, ride. Uh, but here we are. Hmm. You know, the great joy for me was, was spending time with Luke Kirby. His work as Lanny Bruce is astonishing. Um, and, and Rachel coming from this dramatic acting background to be able to realize the authenticity of being on stage, uh, that live, uh, live and die by every nanosecond, um, based on the live audiences and those monologues that Amy and Dan Ryder are, uh, so true that I don't really have a sense of why am I not doing that? It's more of a sense of, well, they got this right. Yeah. Well, I also, since you actually did work, I, I hope you don't mind me asking, but since you did work with Bob Saget on his last movie that he directed, I was just wondering if you had any sort of memories of working with him that you'd like to share uh, just super quick. Oh yeah. No, I love working with Bob. Known him through standup, obviously from the early eighties. And um, he was kind enough to be a subject in, in the documentary I de uh, directed called Misery Loves Comedy. And then, yeah, the last thing he directed, I was one of the actors in. And yeah, you know, a sense of one of the nicest, sweetest, most loving men in, in any business. But also I instantly regretted how often I yelled at him on the set of, of his movie that he didn't know what the hell he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Tony, just before I leave, uh, you probably get asked about Monk all the time, but with sure. so many revivals and reunions coming along, is there any sort of chance that Monk comes back? There is a there is a good chance actually. There we're in discussion now uh, about uh, like a, a a movie, a, a TV movie, a Monk returning. You know, kind of folding in the pandemic uh, story. And, oh yeah, uh, so it's kind of, <laughs> we have. Um, we haven't seen the script yet, but there it is definitely um, in the planning stages. I can say that. And okay. You get to break that story, Daniel. Ooh, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you uh, too for, so much for uh, taking the time to speak with us, and wish you the best of luck on season four.